to ask you to come with me on a journey again, just or even at least think that you're going in this uh, time machine. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whoever Allah guides no one can misguide but whoever Allah leaves to go astray no one can guide and I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Just over 24 years ago, subhanAllah, I first went down to Speaker's Corner. Let me tell you a little bit about my situation at that time. I had spent about four months with my parents in Portugal and that's where I really started practicing Islam and I lived a very isolated life there I didn't know any Muslims the only thing I had as a companion was the Quran I think I know always 40 hadith I think Bertrand Russell's uh, history of Western philosophy which I used to read uh, and really a lot of dhikr, a lot of thinking, a lot of praying and my early very clumsy attempts at dawah, very clumsy attempts at dawah. I mean the first thing when I started to practice Islam properly was the feeling was so fantastic. I felt so good. Subhanallah the world was a different world. It's as if I was looking at the trees, the sky, the sea, the earth, the animals, the insects in a totally new way. Everything I looked at, I could see the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the signs, the proofs, the evidences of Allah. It's just amazing. And I used to make dhikr, a lot of dhikr. Subhanallah, I remember I used to make the adhan to pray. I was just by myself. There was no one else to pray with me. And I used to almost feel as the Prophet wasallam said, when a man, he is alone in the desert and he makes the call to prayer, the angels line up to make the salah behind him. And I used to feel like that. Sometimes my brother, he had a dog, which my parents were looking after. It was a Doberman called Flopsy. Yeah, I know, a Doberman called Flopsy. This dog, I mean, I know we, we have a thing with dogs, or at least some Muslims do, but it was an amazing dog, I have to say. Sometimes I used to talk to Flopsy. I say, you, you know what, Flopsy? The only Muslims in this house is you and me. <laughs> right? And he used to look at me. Like, yeah, man. <laughs> so I know where you're coming from. This is a, he was a cool dog, I tell you, it was amazing. Flopsy, yeah. And, uh, and in my enthusiasm, in my enthusiasm, you know, I was just, you know, I mean, the only people really to give down to my parents and their neighbors, right? And I was telling them whatever I could about Islam. But you know, in retrospect, what I realized is the way it came across to my mum and dad was, as, as my mum actually quite, she actually pointed this out to me. And one day she, I was sitting in my room and she came down, she sat down next to me. 
And she said, you know what? She, she said, if you want to be religious, why, why don't you go and live in a monastery? I said, that's not Islam. In Islam, we don't do that. You know, we, we worship God, but we live in this world as well. She said, well, you know what? Since you hate us so much and since you hate everything about our lifestyle so much, I just thought I'd let you know that I've taken you out of the inheritance. That's quite a thing to be disinherited by your parents. So I said, oh, thanks, mom. It's nice. You know. But, you know, alhamdulillah, honestly, really, I didn't care. Because I really knew in my heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would look after me. But like I said, my early attempts at dawah were, I, I could say, really crude. And I really thought that, I had this idea that every single wrong I saw happening, I had to do something about it. And I was so extreme on that regard that when it was Christmas time, my mum decided, which she never goes to church, but she decided she was going to go off to midnight mass. And I actually had, I had this, I nearly did it. I nearly decided to sit in protest in the middle of the driveway. She, she couldn't drive the car out to go to midnight because I wanted to stop her worshipping Jesus. You know. um, my mum and dad pretty much soon got fed up with me and basically asked me to leave and sent me back to London. My dad more or less said, it's about time you left and you know, go back. And he actually said, it'd be good for you if you spent some time with some other Muslims. And that's actually probably quite a good piece of advice he gave me. Um, I came back to London. Um, and pretty soon, it must have been within the first week, I went down to Speaker's Corner. I met some Muslims in the London Central Mosque who ended up being friends of mine for many years. And we went down together to Speaker's Corner. And there in Speaker's Corner was a Christian standing up. And he was shouting and screaming about how Jesus, he's God and he's the Son of God. And even though I used to be a Christian, I was sent to a Roman Catholic monastic boarding school. But in spite of that fact that I used to believe this stuff, when I heard this Christian insulting Allah, because let's remind ourselves of what Allah says in the Quran, that the heavens are ready to rent asunder, the mountains are ready to crumble into ruin, and the earth is ready to split apart because they say that Ar Rahman has a son. This is what Allah tells us about the state of the universe. This is an insult to Allah. And when I heard this Christian saying, that Jesus is the son of Allah, I was so angry. And I pointed my finger and I, I said, no he isn't. And I didn't know what else to say. I, I honestly, di I didn't know what else to say. So subhanAllah, I went to a bookshop. In fact, this is the place where I first actually sort of embraced Islam and prayed with Muslims. Just out, not Finsbury Park, not the new Finsbury Park, you know, the famous, the infamous Finsbury Park Mosque, but the Muslim Welfare House, which is, I don't know if it's still there, I think it is. And I was browsing through the bookstall, and, and I saw this book, The Choice. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this book, The Choice. The Choice, of co course, is a compilation of Ahmed Didat's booklets. And I picked this up and I started looking through it and I just couldn't believe it. I said, this is just too good to be true. This is brilliant. I took this book, was reading it and reading it, and next week I went down to Speaker's Corner and I had my ammunition. And for the next year, weekend after weekend, I pestered these Christians with verse after verse and quote after quote. And actually, what I realized is I actually knew the Bible better than even Ahmed did. I could think of a few arguments that he hadn't even come up with. So I started adding my own stuff. This is how I started giving dawah. But after about a couple of years of this, I also realized that, wait a minute, Okay, this is very good for bashing Christianity, but I'm not actually telling people about Islam. And actually, really, that's what we need to do. 
I realized that's what I needed. I wanted to tell. I didn't really want to bash Christianity. I wanted to tell people what Islam was really about. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, the most people often ask me, could you recommend a book, a really good book that can teach you how to give dawah? I was asked this question a lot, and I always, and I still would say the same thing. The best book for anyone who wants to know how to give dawah is the Quran. And they say, no, 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 I know, I know the Quran. I said, no, no, no. It's the Qur'an. Believe me. The Qur'an, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters. The, how many times in the Qur'an does it say? If they ask you about this, say to them that. If they say this, then say that. Whether you are arguing with an atheist, whether you're arguing with a Christian, whether you're arguing with a Jew, whether you're arguing with a polytheist, you will find the essence of every argument you need is in the Qur'an. But something else about the Qur'an, brothers and sisters, in respect to da'wah. It's not only a book that practically can guide you how to give da'wah, to tell you what to say. But another thing is, it's a book of motivation. It's a book of guidance. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, Alif Lamim, Thalik al Kitabu la Raiba fi Hudal lil Mutaqeen. Alif Lamim, this is the book. Without doubt, in it is guidance for the pious people. The Quran is a book of guidance. Primarily, the Quran is a book to guide us and to inspire us, and to motivate us. And when we look at the Qur'an, and we look at the teachings of the Qur'an, and we look at the stories in the Qur'an, and we look to those people who are the best of all the human beings, the prophets, and Allah tells us their stories, because... They are examples for us to follow. The messengers are examples for us to follow. They are the most pious, the most righteous. And what they occupied themselves with was the best thing that a human being can ever occupy themselves with. And I've made this challenge many times before, and I make it again. And even though I repeat myself, I will re-repeat myself. I invite you to read the Qur'an and find for me in the Qur'an and describe to me from the Qur'an the Salah of Nuh, the Tahajjud of Nuh, the Dhikr of Nuh, the Sadaqah of Nuh, the Zuhud of Nuh. This messenger of Allah, who is an example for us all to follow, you will not find anything, and I challenge you in the Quran about his salah or his dhikr or his fasting or his sadaqah or his renouncing the world. Everything we know about Nuh alayhi salam is about what? Sorry? His dawah. His dawah. And really, if you look at the rest of the prophets, whether you look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, most of what we find in the Quran about Ibrahim is about what? His, his dawah. Most of it. Yes, there is other stuff, but most of it is his da'wah. Musa, again, most of what we find in the Qur'an about Musa is his da'wah. Isa, the same thing. 
because this was the task of all the prophets but Allah did not send a messenger to any nation except that he called the people na'budullah to worship Allah to single out Allah alone for worship and to reject the worship of the false gods and every god other than Allah is a false god this was the task of the messengers and this of course as you heard from Adnan Rashid may Allah have mercy upon him and increase him in goodness and his ability to give da'wah Amin. You heard about the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You heard about his endeavors and his efforts and his struggling. And what he suffered in the path of da'wah. Now my dear brothers and sisters, may Allah shower his mercy and blessings and forgiveness upon you. My dear brothers and sisters, are there any other prophets to come? Are there any more prophets after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No, because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is khatam al nabiyin He is the seal of the messengers. There will be no more prophets. Even when Isa alayhi salam returns, he will return as a follower. Not in the capacity of a prophet. He will return as a follower. Of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now if there are no more prophets, brothers and sisters, whose duty is it to continue the task of the messengers? On whose shoulders does it lie to spread the message, to give the da'wah? Whose responsibility is it? Let me ask you. Hmm? Ours. Absolutely. There are two reasons why we're having this retreat. Number one is that, from what we can gather, the main thing, the main barrier between a new Muslim um, taking the shahad and then going back to whatever they were on before. Uh, and staying a Muslim is knowledge. If they are equipped with knowledge and the right understanding of the religion, inshallah they will stay Muslim. If they don't have that knowledge base, the likelihood is they'll just slip back into whatever they were before. So we want to provide new Muslims with a good knowledge base. The second thing is we want to create a, an emotional experience, an emotional space. It's not really about knowledge in the sense of ilmi knowledge, but it's knowledge, I suppose, of a different kind, emotional knowledge, an emotional space. We want to f make them feel connected to other Muslims and, in fact, in reality, connected to each other. And so a lot of what the retreat is about is about creating an experience, creating an atmosphere. I'm sure a lot of people will go away from here um, not maybe having learnt that much in terms of information, but what is really important is they do go away with a really positive experience that is going to stay with them for a long time. It's our responsibility, brothers and sisters, individually, according to your capacity, and collectively. The duty is ours. And what I am doing today, and what the brothers and the sisters, may Allah reward all of them, for their hard work in bringing these events together. What they are trying to do for themselves and for you, brothers and sisters, is to help you fulfill your duty, your obligation to be callers to Allah. It is a duty and it is an obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قُلْ 
هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي عُدُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةِ أَنَا وَمَنْ أَتَبَعَانِي Say, O oh Muhammad, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my way. This is my way. Allah is telling our Rasul, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to say to us, you want to know the sabil of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You want to know his way? You want to know his path? Hadihi sabili. This is my way. What is it? Uddu Allah. I call to Allah. To call to Allah. This is our dawah. To call to La ilaha illallah. We are not calling people to be Pakistanis or to be Bengalis or to be Saudis. We're not calling people to be Arab or to follow some culture or to follow some sheikh or to follow some madhab or tariqah. No, Allah did not ask us to call to those things. He did not say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to call to those things. He said for the Prophet, and this is his sabil, to call to Allah. To call to Allah. To call to la ilaha illallah. This is the dawah of all the messengers. This is the duty. This is the obligation. And how? Ala basira. With certain knowledge. With definite knowledge. Call with knowledge. Calling is an obligation. And in order to fill, fulfill any obligation in Islam, you must have knowledge. Action precedes knowledge. Sorry, knowledge precedes action. Before, before, before action has to come knowledge. I was thinking about that. There's something wrong there. Before action has to come knowledge. Otherwise, it would be like that famous story of the man in ancient times in our history who once, he was very enthusiastic. He, was a really, he wanted to give dawah, this guy. So he sees this Jew walking along. That's it. Grabs the Jew, gets out his sword, says, Jew, become a Muslim, I'll chop your head off. So the Jew goes, all right, all right, what shall I do? What, tell me what shall I do. He says, wallahi, I don't know. <laughs> right? And, and that's, that's, you know, like me, when I said in the beginning, you know, full of enthusiasm. You know, you have to get the knowledge. It's not, it's not a question, it's not a question of if, but it's a question of you have to do it, brothers and sisters. Before you pray, you have to learn how to pray. You can't just do anything you randomly think might be prayer. You have to learn how to pray. You have to learn how to make wudu. You have to learn how to make hajj. You have to learn the rules of fasting. You have to learn these things. You have to learn how to give dawah. Because it's an obligation along with every other obligation that you have in Islam. And you will be asked by Allah on that day about which there is no doubt. That day that is coming very, very soon, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, it's coming soon. It is coming soon. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and he was sitting with his companions and the sun was about to set. And the Prophet said, between my coming and the end of the world is like the time from the sun to its setting. And that was 1,400 years ago. So how close are we now to the end of days? The first sign of the last days was the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how soon is our death? How imminent is the end of your life and my life? SubhanAllah, I was saying to my son, Abdullah, mashallah, just got married recently, alhamdulillah. I was embarrassing, I'm going to embarrass him even more now. <laughs> you know, but seriously, brothers and sisters, I remember, and I remember this vividly, lying on my bed with Abdullah, little baby, lying on my chest. 
like this. And I couldn't sleep because I was thinking, is he breathing? You know, your first kid, it's like that, right? It's like, is he still alive? You know, right? This fragile little thing, you know, you got no, the second one, it's like, yeah, chuck him here, chuck him there. <laughs> They're all right, they're tough, you know. But, but Abdullah got the, you know, like, is, is he alive? I, I remember literally lying, is he breathing? And then, uh, yeah, okay. <sighs> you know. And he, he's, he's, he's got married. He's got married. Subhanallah. That's the life, brothers and sisters. Like, it seems like yesterday. It's like yesterday. This is the life. It's just so short. You know, we might as well be those, you know, those flies that exist for a day, those gadflies. That just, that's it, our life. Just like a day, a butterfly for a day. But, you know, this little day that we have, this brief moment in time, at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, it's you in front of Allah on the day of judgment. And this brief day that you have, that's what you need to make use of. Because this little time that you have, this moment that you have, that will end very, very soon, is what you need to make use of in order to get to a place, to get to a place that will never end. Its happiness will be eternal. And every day there will be more, will be better, more exciting, more stimulating, more beautiful than the day before. Every moment will be better than the moment that came before it. A place there is no hatred, no envy, no greed, just peace. Gardens, rivers of delight. This is paradise. Eternity. Forever and ebkhalidina fiha. They will stay in there forever. But what you do here, this little moment that you have, this brief moment of time, is going to decide what's going to happen to you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And honestly, if anyone can tell me a better way to spend your time, a better way to earn the pleasure of Allah, than doing what the prophets did, if you can show me something that has the potential for so much reward, tell me, please. Show me what has the potential for so much reward as dawah. Show me a deed that is so consistently done by the best of human beings other than dawah. Subhanallah. The quality of the one who calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The potential for reward. But imagine this. And you already, already heard Adnan, he mentioned about the red camels. Here's another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet said, whoever invites a person to a righteous action will get the reward of that person acting on that righteous action without that person's reward being diminished in the least. So if you are the means through whom Allah guides just one person to Islam, think about it. Every time they pray, every time they fast, every time they give sadaqah, every time they say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, when they make hajj, when they read Quran, when they get married and have kids and teach their kids salah and to read Quran, you will get rewarded for it. And their kids' kids, and their kids' kids. Because you were the means through whom that person became Muslim. What has a potential for so much reward? Brothers and sisters, our life is short. Our time here is short. We have a duty, an obligation to pass on this message. To commit ourselves to make the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the highest. To save ourselves from the hellfire. And of course, to do whatever we can to save our fellow human beings. Our fellow human beings. Brothers and sisters in humanity. And that's true. We are all from one father and one mother. 
All of us came from Adam and Eve. That's true. There's no doubt about it. We are the human family. Whether the people admit it or not, it's the truth. And just a thought, brothers and sisters, of anyone suffering in the hellfire. Subhanallah, the hellfire. Whose fuel is men and stones. A place where people will be in such pain. Where the skins will be burnt and recreated and reburnt so the people can taste the punishment. Where the heat and the thirst and the hunger, people will be screaming and calling for drink. And the drink will come. The drink will come. But this drink is boiling water like molten copper that will scald their faces and burn their insides. And how long is this hellfire, brothers and sisters? For how long will people stay in there? Forever. Khalidina fiha. They will stay in there forever. This is the consequence. So we have a duty. We have a duty of care. We have a duty of compassion. We have a duty of concern. What does it say about us? As human beings, that our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, how many of us, we can complain about this society, but how many of us benefit so much from this country in which we live? We benefit so much. I don't find us all running to go back to Pakistan. Oh, let me catch the next flight. That's where I want to live. No. No, no, no. We're quite comfortable here. Settling down. Our kids live here. Come on, let's be honest. Don't we have a duty? Don't we have a duty? At least to tell them, to let them know, to pass the message, to warn them. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Think about this. Imagine the situation. Imagine the situation that you lived or that you human beings, we human beings existed in a vast labyrinth, a maze. A maze of confusion. And the people were running around trying to get out of this maze. Confused. And you had the map. And instead of trying to tell everybody, I've got the map, here's the way out. You just pick it up and you just walk out yourself. And imagine all of those people seeing you, getting out of the maze. Going to this beautiful palace on the hill which they're all trying to get to and they see you there holding this book what are they going to think about you what does that say about you brothers and sisters this is a duty and to think about this duty I want to give you another story this is the story of Abdullah Abdullah and the king. You see, there was this great and powerful king, brothers and sisters. And he received news that a land was agreeing to make itself subservient to him. So the king sent his trusted servant, Abdullah. Oh, Abdullah, said the king, go to that land and tell the people, I am their king. They should obey my laws and pay my taxes. So Abdullah goes. And years pass. Years pass. And the king has heard nothing from Abdullah. So the king sends his another trusted servant, Ahmed. Ahmed, go and see what has happened to Abdullah. I'm concerned about him. So Ahmed goes and travels to this land. And he begins to ask the people, he says, people, have you, have, you, have you seen Abdullah? They say Abdullah, who we never heard of anyone called Abdullah. So he starts to describe Abdullah. He looks like this, and you know, he wears a hat, he has a beard, you know. They say, like, yes. But his name's he's not Abdullah, it's Abs. 
Yeah, we know Abs, very nice man. He's very friendly, very nice. Yeah, yeah. He lives on the outside of the town in a nice house. He's got a nice business selling vegetables. Right? So he goes there, he goes to the house. Sure enough, there he finds Abdullah. Abdullah Ahmed said, I've been sent by the king. And the king is asking after you, what has happened? Didn't the king tell you to come here and tell the people that he is their king? And that you should obey his laws and pay his taxes? And Abdullah Abs, he says, yes, yes, that's true. He said, you know, I love the king. I've always loved the king. I always praise the king. I have never had another king besides the king. But... I thought, you know what I'd do is I'd just come here and start a business and show the people that, you know, we're nice people. You know, we can get on. You know, bit by bit, I was thinking maybe one day I'd get around, you know, that, that maybe they'd accept the king through my example. Does that sound familiar, brothers and sisters? Is Abdullah you? Is that you? Brothers and sisters, Allah gave us a command to warn the people. Arise and warn. The first thing the Prophet wasallam, when he was told to call the people publicly to Islam, he went on the top of Mount Safa and he called the people. He called them by name of each tribe and each tribe their leader came and if the leader didn't come they sent a representative. And he started by saying, Oh my people, I have come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. In another narration, I warn you of a nar, I warn you of a nar, I warn you of a nar. Three times I warn you of the fire. He warned them, brothers and sisters. He said, if I was to tell you there was an army about to attack us from behind the hill, would you believe me? They said, of course, Muhammad, we never heard anything but truth from you. I've come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. We have to warn the people because the threat is real. The danger is imminent. Our duty is clear. That's why we're here, brothers and sisters. I era is here to help you fulfill that obligation. So you don't have to be in the situation like I was when I first started practicing Islam, full of enthusiasm. Really, I wanted to tell my parents and their friends about Islam, but I just didn't know what to say. Like that when I, time when I went to Speaker's Corner. Uh, no, he isn't. No. Why not educate yourself? Why not benefit from years of experience? My experience, Hamza Sotsis' experience, Salim Chegtai's experience, Adnan Rashid's experience, many of the brothers and sisters, mashallah, who have joined us. And who have now huge amounts of experience, mashallah, in giving dawah every day because they've made dawah a part of their everyday life. So one of the first things we're going to be doing here in Birmingham as soon as we can is we're going to be holding one of our dawah training courses. Right? It's a one-day dawah training course where we will teach you some simple basic techniques on how to give dawah. So you know what, brothers and sisters? All I'm asking for you is a commitment. I want you to put your hands up if you're going to do everything you can to try and come to that dawah training course. Let me see your hands up. Can't really see much, but inshallah. Sisters, you got your hands up? Excellent. Mashallah. I don't know how we're going to fit you all in because usually there's about 50 in a go. But inshallah, inshallah, if you have to come here, I don't know, 10 times, inshallah, we will do it, inshallah, brothers and sisters. Yeah? Because we want to empower you to give the da'wah, to fulfill that obligation to Islam. I pray to Allah, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allows you to taste the sweetness of someone being guided to Islam through you. It's the most beautiful thing. May Allah bless you, may Allah guide you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
يقال العمى فقد النظر قلت البصيرة للبصر قالوا المحبة نقمة لا خير منها ينتظر وإن استمرت لا تدوم كبيت رمل في المطار قلت المحبة لا تموت بعاشق